I'm Suzanne Dane with the Nutrition Research Institute, and this is Appetite for Life. And I see a lot of familiar faces, so thank you all for coming out again to our free public series. Um, I see some new faces too, so thank you to you if you've uh, just come to see us for the first time. This is a monthly public series uh, that's nearly every month of the year. And we will be doing this occasionally down in Charlotte, so follow our website and our emails and keep up with what we're doing. This evening, you're going to hear a really exciting talk about how to keep your brain stem cells happy. And uh, I am not going to bother to give you her biography because it's there on the page for you. And she's going to talk a little bit about her journey here. And so I want you to please welcome with me Dr. Natalia Serzenko. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. It was a gorgeous evening outside. I was almost hating to keep you all here, but anyway. So I'll tell you a little bit about myself to begin. And that's the reason, the reason is because I have an accent. So people, first thing they ask me is, where are you from? So I'll get that out of the way. I'm from Estonia, which is a small uh, country in the northern Europe, and it's on the Baltic Sea, and it looks like this most of the time. We have very short summer, maybe five days. <laughs> snow in May, and snow in September, so every time when there's sun out, the entire country is on the beach, and they're trying to, to bathe in the cold, cold water. Anyway, so um, when I grew, you know, after I grew up in Estonia, I uh, moved to Aiken, South Carolina, and that's where I did my bachelor's degree. And I studied biology because I liked animals and I had no idea what I was getting into. And then my advisor also offered me to go to grad school and I went to UNC Chapel Hill for graduate school. And I did my PhD in neurobiology. And I also went to grad school uh, with a program that designed for people who have no idea what they're gonna do. And they just allowed to wander around and try labs. <laughs> like, uh, you could try dentistry, you could try psychology, you could do anything. And so that helped me a lot because then I figured I'd probably stay in neurobiology. And then after that, I did some uh, postdoctoral studies at Harvard Medical School in the Department of Genetics. And that was a very vibrant, interesting environment. And after that, I moved to Canapolis, basically. And I work at NRI right now. So it's been about two years. So in our institute, we study how we metabolize nutrients and how the, our nutrient metabolism relates to our genetic makeup. So basically, different people might be metabolizing nutrients differently. And so we need to figure out you know, what people need what nutrient more or less, and so on and so forth. But my primary. Um, interest is to try to understand how nutrients during development and in adulthood would affect brain function, um, how nutrients can affect brain development, and maybe how they're maybe ameliorating some of the cognitive decline or age-related cognitive decline in some of the neurologic diseases. And so I will talk about, well, I'll introduce my lab. That's our lab. And actually, this is the institute director, Steve Zizel, and we kind of all work in his lab, so basically, um, it's a pretty big group, and some of us you can see here today. Um, so I'll talk about stem cells, what they are, because there's a lot of you know, um, information out there, and we still don't quite know what stem cells are, where they are, what we do, what stem cell research is. Then I will talk about neural stem cells, the, the cell, cells that can sort of regenerate some of the neurons in our brains when we're adults, actually. And then I will talk about how they come about, and so how are they formed, where do they come from, and then a little bit about nutrients that affect their function in adulthood, and then the lifestyle factors that can affect neural stem cell function. And so, um, well, the hope for the whole neural stem cell research and the neural, you know, in general, stem cell research is to be able to repair tissues. So basically, if we break an arm, you know, or if the arm is amputated, it would be nice to grow one. And some low organisms do, some salamanders actually do grow their arms. And so research study, how do you actually grow an arm new? And so that's the whole hope is to basically to be able to renew some tissues that are diseased and replace some cells that are getting old and so on. 
And so we also can use neural stem cells to understand how brain diseases happen. So we can make neurons out of their cells and study what exactly is wrong with them so we can figure out what drugs could work for those conditions. And then, of course, we want to better management our cognitive decline and decline memory and brain function with age. So stem cells are these funny cells that can do two things. They can divide to produce copy of, it, of themselves. So basically, stem cells will divide into two cells, and both are stem cells. So that's how we maintain our pool of stem cells all the time. And they also can divide and produce daughter cells that will become any other cell type in the body. And so basically, it can be liver cell or brain cell, depends on where the stem cells are. And so a lot of what we know about stem cells come from uh, embryonic stem cell research. And that was a lot of debate about it. And I will talk a little bit about it. And so the stem cells, based on what they can give rise to, will be classified into pluripotent. That means they can give rise to anything in our body, any other cell type in the body. Or multipotent, which means they can give rise to some cell types, but not others. And then unipotent would be mean one. Like one stem cell will produce one cell type all the time. And so. How stem cells are different from other cells is because they have different genes that are active. So if a stem cell, for instance, here, will have genes A and GB on, active and functioning, and then let's say it decides to become a fat cell, it can no longer maintain this gene's functioning because then this, this fat cell will also be sort of like a stem cell. So it has to switch those genes off and turn on the genes that will allow this cell to become a fat cell. And this happens for any other cells, basically. If you want to become a liver cell, you need liver genes. So then, because you have to look like a liver cell, function like a liver cell, you cannot maintain your stem cell genes. And if you want to be a stem cell, you know, then you have to maintain genes active that will allow you to become anything else in the body. And so that's the basic principle of, uh, and this process is called differentiation. You probably hear it from me today. Um, sorry. So a lot of what we know about stem cells come from embryonic stem cell research. And there was a lot of debate, ethical, not ethical, useful, not useful, funded, not funded. And all of this was happening while researchers were trying to understand what the stem cells actually are. And why they're so interesting is because, as you can see here, like the early embryo is full of, it's just a ball of cells. And if you can imagine it will grow into a whole you know, human being, for instance, or an animal, that means that ball of cell contains cells that can give rise to anything in the body. So there will be skin cell coming from there, bone cells, and liver cells, and kidney cells, and everything. So that one little cell here would be like a stem cell, basically. And that's a pluripotent cell. It can give rise to anything. And so research were able to isolate those cells, mostly from animal models, like mouse, for instance, laboratory mouse. We can isolate those cells and culture them in a dish, and then study what makes them stem cell and what makes them be, give rise to all other cell types. And so all of this research was going on, and some research were able to get their hands on, on some human embryonic stem cell, which was really hard and it was very highly regulated. But in the end, while all this debate was going on, there was this breakthrough technology that now we don't need embryonic stem cells. What the technology is, really, you can take, let's say you have a patient, you can take a little biopsy of skin from the patient, you can put those cells in a dish and culture them for a little bit. And then you can add these four factors that are proteins, basically, and researchers figured out what they are. You can put them into those skin cells, and those skin cells, with time, will become stem cells. They're called induced pluripotent cells because they're not exactly stem cell, but they're basically stem cells, so they can give rise now to everything. And that comes from the patient's skin biopsy, pretty much. So now we can do a lot of different things. So for instance, you can take them and make them, like for instance, repair a gene mutation. Let's say a patient had, let's say, mutation, the gene that's important for heart muscle function. So you can um, take those cells, which are now stem cells from the skin, and repair that gene function, make a new gene, put a new gene in, and then make the heart muscle cells <clears throat> and put those cells back into the patient, basically, transplant them back. So now the patient has a corrected mutation and a muscle that can function normally in the heart. So that's like breakthrough. And so the two people responsible for that actually won a Nobel Prize for this technology. And uh, what else you can do is actually, like I was saying before, 
uh, select a drug that might be functioning better for that particular patient. For instance, you can make those stem cells, make them into affected cell type. Let's say it's neurons in the brain and we really don't know uh, what the underlying pathological condition, why are they not functioning properly. And you can study them in a dish, you can find a drug that maybe correct that problem and then um, you know, treat the patient with that drug that we selected. So it's really great. So that's kind of sideline about stem cell research in general, but you know, just to show you a little bit. So skin stem cells, so this is a mouse that normally doesn't make hair. You know the cats that don't make hair? Dogs, you know, there's some nude cats and dogs and people breed them and you know. So there's some mice that don't have hair. And so for research to prove you have a stem cell, you really need to show to other research that you have a stem cell because they don't believe you. And so the way to show it is that the mouse that normally make, doesn't make hair, typically, because they don't have a gene or they have a mutation, they just don't make hair. So if you put those stem cells under the skin, they will start growing hair. And that's the only way they can grow hair is because it comes from those cells. So that's the proof that this is a stem cell. <laughs> anyway, and so, and another way, like I was saying, you can make a heart muscle. So here's an example. It's iPS cells. These are induced cells, pluripotent cells that were isolated from the skin, basically, and they induced to become heart muscle in a dish, and now they're beating like a heart, basically. So now there are ways to try to shape those cells so that they actually take a form of a muscle and that, you know, that it's easier to transplant. And the funny thing is, it's, well, it's a good thing that they come from that patient. So the patient's not going to reject those. They're their own cells, basically. So they're not going to reject them as a foreign donor type cells. And yeah, this is just an image of some neurons that are born in culture, again, from skin cells. Okay, so then, in our bodies, normally, so these are embryonic stem cells and that's the technology, but in our bodies, when we're adults, we have stem cells pretty much in every organ that we have. So um, today I'm going to be talking about brain, there's some stem cells in the eye and all other organs, basically. And so there's some examples here. This is the intestinal stem cell because we are intestines aligned with this epithelial layer, so it has to be renewed. And a lot of tissues where cells have to be renewed, like skin, you have to have stem cells going on. And with aging, the numbers of stem cells declines and that's where the renewal becomes slower and harder to do. But typically organs that need constant renewal uh, will have a niche, like a, a population of stem cells as we are adults basically. And so the research can also, you know, researchers can isolate them and study them a little bit and understand how we can activate us, our endogenous stem cells in our bodies when we're just walking around every day. And these are some pictures from the brain stem cells which I will talk about in a minute. So brain stem cells reside in a region called hippocampus. And it's a learning and memory center in the brain. It's like a bilateral structure. We have them on both sides of the brain. And it's responsible for us forming new memories, learning everything new, recovering the memories, and a lot of other behaviors. So this is just a structure. This is actually a mouse hippocampus, but this is a, the layer of cells that will have new neurons added to it by stem cells all the time. And those new neurons will be required to acquire new memories is a new learning experience and so on. And this mouse actually, uh, it's called Brainbow. It's not Rainbow, it's Brainbow because it has um, neurons labeled with different colors and that helps researchers to see how they're organized, where they sig signal to, you know, where they're connected to and it's just pretty picture that I'll put it here. Um, so yeah, this is a regular picture of stem cells. Again, they're lining this zone in the hippocampus called uh, subgranular zone in the hippocampus. So these stem cells are not uh, pluripotent like embryonic stem cells. So they can give rise to liver or to skin or anything, but they can give rise to all the cells in the nervous system. So in the nervous system, there are a couple cell types. I will talk to, to you about them, but basically they're multipotent. And so one of the most important cell types in the nervous system in the brain is a neuron. And it's a very funny looking cell. It has this long, long tail and it has a cell body. And the nucleus is where our DNA, basically our genes are. Um, and so it has this little other, um, you know, outbursts or whatever they're called, the protrusions. And so what the neuron does is basically it receives information from some other area, from a neuron. Or if you have neurons in the skin, it will receive information from uh, receptors that are responding to touch or to pain or to something like that. And so it will receive information on this side, in, in this area called the dendrites or these protrusions, and it will get excited. 
So it will get so excited that it will fire an action potential, it's called. It's just a, like an electrical stimulus. And it will fire it, it will travel through this tail to another neuron. And then that neuron gets excited. And then it goes on and on and on. And so basically, if you can understand, so if you, you know, let's say you put your hand on a hot plate, and then that neuron gets excited, oh my god, I'm hot. <laughs> and then it has to signal further, 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 and then it gets to the brain, and the brain goes, oh, oh my gosh, I'm hot. And so then the brain has to decide to have to, you know, activate the muscle to take your hand off the plate, and that's how it all happens, basically. It's the neuron talking to each other. And when they talk to each other, they talk to each other in this place called the synapse. So basically it's a little, so basically there are a lot of synapses that they make with each other. And what they do when this action potential, this electrical stimulus reach this place of the, of the connection, they release a chemical called a neurotransmitter. And that's how they signal to the other neuron to get excited basically. Okay, so that's neurons. And in reality, so they look very, very strange. So, so there was a Spanish scientist, Ramon Cajal, who spent a lot of time staining all kinds of animal tissues he could get his hands on with like dyes and try to, to fill the cells with the dye so that you can see the morphology. So this is a Purkinje cell in the cerebellum, so at the back of the brain, like a motor coordinating center. And see how the dendrites are shaped? They're like, you know, tons of them. So apparently that cell needs to receive a lot of information. And so today I'm going to talk a little bit about pyramidal neurons here. And these reside in our cortex. And the cortex is that convoluted part of the brain that's whole pretty much the entire surface of the brain. And it's divided into different areas, like there's an area responsible for sensory information, some are like emotions, like prefrontal cortex, emotion, decision making, so on. But basic structure of these neurons is like this, basically. They have this bushy dendrites, and then they have an axon will send information somewhere else in the brain or something like that. And so there are other two types in the brain of the cells. And these are not neurons, and these are like sort of supporting cells. So they're called glial cells. And so one is astrocyte. Mm -hmm. Astrocytes are, well, we think of them as the supporting. So they provide nutrients to <coughs> neurons. And they also, when the neurons talk to each other and they secrete that neurotransmitter, that little substance, they actually take it up so, so that other neurons that f for whom the signal wasn't intended don't get excited. So the, the glial cell will reuptake the neurotransmitter. And then there are these um, oligodendrocytes. And these guys will form a myelin sheath around the axon so that the electrical stimulus travels with no problem faster. So it's insulated, basically. So it's like a lipid sheath around the axons. And that's important because when you touch the hot plate, you kind of need to know exactly that you, you are on the hot because, you know, by the time the signal gets to the brain, you might burn your hand. So, you know, the, the transmission has to go real fast. And there are some cases where the axons are not myelinated and probably sometimes you don't want to react to everything like this. So some, in some cases, it's good to not have a very fast transmission. So anyway, these are supporting cells. But all of these three cell types will come from our stem cells in the, in the brain. So to, now I'm going to talk a little bit about development of the brain, and that's important because it's important to understand where our adult stem cells come from. So when the brain is little, and this is cross-section, so here's the cortex, and this is mouse brain, but human will be probably at this stage a little bit more convoluted uh, because we have gyri, and other animals, some of them, most of them don't because our surface area for cortex is really, you know, large because we have to pack a lot of information and mice don't apparently. So, um, so here's cross section and so this is the cortex and um, I'm showing these layers as multicolored is because the, the actual cortical neuronal layers consi consist of different types of neurons. So I just colored them with different colors because they're actually not all the same. Depending on where they are, high or low, they can do totally different things. And so here's just the cartoon showing how they might be organized. So these guys are actually our embryonic neural stem cells. So these are the guys that will give rise to all the neurons and all the glia and all the oligodendrocytes during development. So what these guys do is they divide, like I mentioned, to amplify their numbers, to maintain their numbers during development, and they can produce neurons, glia, and when the development is ended, basically, so there's all neurons produced, all glia are produced, 
what the remaining uh, neural stem cells will do is they will become adult stem cells. So basically it matters how many you start with because that will tell you how many you will end up with. So development and how many neural stem cells you have during development, how well they function, will determine how many you may end up with when you're adult. And that's going to be important when I will talk about one of the nutrients that we study in our lab. Just for fun, I thought I'll show you how cells really look like in real life and not on the cartoon. So this is a, this neural stem cells during development. What it does is divides and then the daughter cells will go up because they have to migrate up to the cortex and the daughter cells will eventually become neurons but they have to go up, up, up high to the cortex. And then I can show you how that actually happens in the neuron. So not happening? <laughs> okay, it doesn't happen. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> okay, it's happening. Okay, so this is just one neuron that was just born and it needs to go all the way here because that's where it's supposed to live and it doesn't want to go. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. Well, okay, so yeah, artificially it will go. So basically I wanted to show you that they are the cells are like little, like little animals. They actually touch, like environment. They sense, and they like have to know where they have to go, and they sometimes go wrong way. They jump and they do something weird. But basically, they have this hand that touches, like environment, the neighbors, and obviously this is like one cell, but obviously this is the tissue full of stuff. So they have to go between each other and so on and so forth. That's just for fun. I thought just. To show it. Anyway, when we have all those neurons born, they all form connections with each other, which are thousands and millions of connections. Because, and that's actually a big, huge area of research because we have no idea. It looks like a mess. So all these lines here are those axons that project somewhere. So some cells from here will project there, some from here will project here, and we have no idea who talks to who and why. And all of this is a big mess. So we have this brain initiative going on where the Institute of um, National Institute of Health um, has provided some funding for figuring this out, actually. <laughs> like, what's connecting to what, and what does it all mean for our brain function, for our cognitive function, for our diseases, you know, disease states, and so on and so forth. So that's an ongoing area of research. Okay, back to neural stem cells. So when we're adults, we have them in our hippocampus, and basically what they do is, again, like I said, they divide to produce newborn neurons. And so these neurons initially are like little immature neurons and then they mature a little bit, they grow the axons and they grow these big dendritic trees. And what we think they're involved in is acquiring, so basically participating in all the learning, new learning experiences, acquiring new memories, and then when we use those memories they will be responsible. So every time we're talking about, you know, uh, memory loss, we'll probably will be talking about reduced neurogenesis, reduced production of those neurons in the hippocampus, although they're really not a huge amount. There's not that many, but you know, when we don't have neurogenesis going on in animal studies, they do lose their ability to form new memories, so their cognitive function is declining. And basically what you're going to understand from today's talk, probably, is that adult neurogenesis is not only important on its own for our memory, but it's also a good indication of our overall health. So a lot of conditions that, you know, make us a little bit less healthy will probably reflect on adult neurogenesis, and that will be happening at a lower rate than we would like to. So yeah, what nutrients and environmental factors regulate adult neurogenesis? So basically the entire talk is summarized here. This is the mouse brain, this is the mouse hippocampus, and basically in red all the bad things, or the bad diet you can do, and the green thing is all the good things you can do. That's it, I'm done. <laughs> anyway, so not good diet, aging, stress, sleep deprivation, and there are other factors I'll mention, will result in fewer neurons added to the hippocampus. And then some stimulating good diet, stimulating activities, exercise, will lead to more neurons produced in the hippocampus. Okay, so then we can go into actual nutrients. So in our lab, we study a nutrient called choline, and it's sort of in a big group of, vitamin group, a group of vitamins. So um, it has three major functions in the cell, 
And one of them is pr to produce acetylcholine. And, and that's a neurotransmitter. That's the substance neuron talk with. So one neuron will spit the neurotransmitter out, the other will sense it, and that's one of the neurotransmitters that neurons use. The other function is to maintain the integrity of phospholipids are actually our cellular sort of membranes. So each cell has a membrane around it, and that membrane is not only important to keep the cell intact and all the DNA and everything intact, but it's also important to interact with the environment. Did you see that neuron? So that was the part of the membrane, you know, the cell's protrusion, the membrane that was sensing the environment and knowing where to go. So all cells always sense their environment, uh, and the membrane uh, of the cell is very important in that process. So if you don't have enough cooling, probably don't have very good uh, cellular function. And so the other uh, function that choline is important for is to produce betaine. And betaine is important to donate what's called methyl group. And methyl group, in this complicated scheme here, basically is important to regulate gene expression. So um, if I, our genes are active, they're not methylated. So there's no methyl group added to those genes. If our genes are inactive, in most cases they're methylated. So for instance, if we don't have enough choline, don't have enough betaine, don't have enough methyl groups, Let's say it's our liver cell, and all of a sudden it will start expressing genes that belong to a fat cell. That's not going to be good. That liver cell is not going to be happy. And I just don't know if it's going to be able to function properly. But, you know, basically to maintain our gene expression in the proper shape, we will probably need choline at least to some degree. And, well, the best sources of choline, for some reason, <laughs> Liver mush and eggs, <laughs> is that what came to mind? You know, liver, eggs, um, a lot of other things, also some vegetables, but basically, um, you know, a lot of meats and beans and protein-rich foods. So these are the best sources. Okay, so back to adult neurogenesis. So how do we know choline regulates adult neurogenesis? So some of the early studies have been done with this nutrient. Uh, people were supplementing animals, for instance, rats or mice, with choline during pregnancy. And then when they took their adult babies, so the pregnant mother was supplemented or not supplemented with choline, and then she had babies, the babies grew up, and now they're adults, and we'll look at their adult neurogenesis. So if the mother had enough choline, and these old cells are newborn neurons. Those neurons I showed you in blue. So they have cell body, they're dendrites here, and there's a certain number of them if the mother was okay with choline during pregnancy. If the mother was deficient, then there's very few of these adults, you know, adult stem cell functioning because we have very few new neurons added. So that means when the mother was deficient during pregnancy, the baby now grew up and now is adult and have fewer, you know, cells produced in the hippocampus, and that also is correlating with their poor cognitive performance and memory function. And then if the mother was supplemented, so they received a little bit more than she was supposed to, when we have much more neurogenesis going on, and that is actually reflecting on the memory and the cognitive function. And that's how researchers actually looked at that. So they took those rats that were supplemented when they were developing or not, whose mothers were supplemented or not, and um, they put them through a task where they have to learn where the treat is. So it's a maze. It's a maze, and some arms of the maze have the treat, some don't, and so the rat has to remember that that arm has a treat and that doesn't. And then they're tested, where, you know, do they remember where to go or not? And so you can tell when they're aging, so the normal rats, the ones that whose mother was a normal choline, they actually show some memory loss with aging. And this is, uh, you know, months, I guess, in age, and it's pretty old for a rat. So they're aging and their memory is kind of declining. And then the ones that had mother who had more choline than she was supposed to, well, more choline, so she was supplemented, they don't show this decline in memory with age. And so that correlates with the adult neurogenesis, they have more neurons born in the hippocampus, and they don't lose their memory. And that is all due to what happened when the mother was pregnant. And so the question is, you know, if we supplement people now, does that correlate with better neurogenesis when we're adults? And there are some studies that are coming out with children and their correlation of their plasma levels and their school performance, for instance. We don't know for sure if we supplement 
recommended adults because in humans it's hard to do. In rats, we kind of started doing, but we don't know for sure yet. But in human children, those children who have high levels of choline in their plasma, in their blood, and they already don't depend on any mom, mom's nutrition or anything, they have better school performance. So basically, it kind of correlates with better cognitive function. Okay, so what we decided to do then is to test why is there fewer stem cells in the brains of those, you know, those adults now whose mother was deficient. So we decided to put moms on a deficient diet and, and specific period during development when all the neurons are supposed to be born. And remember I told you that adult stem cell comes from the embryonic stem cell. And so we decided to check do we have fewer embryonic stem cells when we have a mother, you know, that's eating low choline diet? And so that's what we ask. And basically what we're looking at is these stem cells, their numbers, and some of the neurons that are born during that time. And this is done in the mouse study. And so here I'm showing you a few cells that are red and green and all that stuff. But you have to, you know, just know the neurons are high here and stem cells are low here. And this is a normal brain and comes from uh, an embryo that had a mother with normal choline levels. And if we look at the brain of the embryo that mother, whose mother was low in choline, that didn't eat enough choline during pregnancy, then we see different picture. We have fewer neurons and we have fewer stem cells. So that makes sense. So now we know why there might be fewer neural stem cells in those adult brains of those offspring who came from mothers who had low choline. But also, this is new to us that there are fewer neurons. We didn't think about that before. And so we decided to check, are there fewer neurons or are we just dreaming or something? Anyway, and so we looked at those brains and we compared, first of all, the brains of the low choline moms, of the embryos of the low choline moms were much smaller and they had this uh, thinner cortex, that la layer of cells, you know, that lines the cortex, that convoluted part. They had fewer, you know, it was thinner, and so we thought there might be fewer neurons, and there indeed are. So if you look here, we have dense numbers of neurons, all marked in red here. And if you look at low choline brains, there are much fewer neurons. Okay, so that's during development. Does that actually persist into adulthood? Because remember, with stem cells, we now think if we have fewer during development, we have fewer in adulthood. What about neurons? Maybe neurons catch up. Maybe there's some, you know, some process that helps us to grow more neurons. And actually, we looked at adult offspring of those animals, and we still see fewer neurons. So this layer, red layer, is much thinner than it would be in a normal choline condition. So that's just one example of a nutrient that um, can affect also both development of the brain and also so, sort of indirectly function of the neural stem cells in the adulthood. So it's important to know that we need to eat you know, plenty of choline um, during pregnancy, obviously, and probably as children grow. And um, yeah, so basically that's the take home message from the choline story. Um, and yeah. <laughs> Let's move on to other nutrients. So it's, it's actually a pretty important uh, modulator of brain development. And we were wondering if there are other nutrients. And obviously, other people were wondering as well. So the, um, one other very important nutrient is basically it's a, it's a set of nutrients, but they're together called omega-3 fatty acids. And so one of them is DHA. And now you can see products labeled with DHA. Their supplements and milks are supplemented with DHA and so on and so forth. So it's a very important regular both development. And in adulthood, supplementation with DHA would also increase neurogenesis and cognitive function and performance on different memory-related tasks. And so you can find DHA or other omega-3 fatty acids in uh, products like fish and green leafy vegetables, flaxseed is rich in some, and so on and so forth. So the other thing, imp imp uh, interesting um, thing about DHA is that it also forms a sort of a, a compound molecule together with choline. So if you have less of one or the other, you can't form this good molecule. And that molecule is actually very important for normal brain function. And in the early stages of Alzheimer's disease, which is kind of age-related cognitive disease, um, there is evidence that this molecule is actually 
uh, is present at, at lower concentration in our bodies, in our blood, and it's a sort of an early sign of the Alzheimer's disease. And if you supplement with choline or with DHA, probably in, in good ratios, you could probably ameliorate some of this progressive um, disease. And so choline um, itself is a, is a modulator of some of the neurologic diseases. So for instance, in Down syndrome can improve uh, motor function, cognitive function. It can improve cognitive function in uh, models of alcohol spectrum, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. So kids who are born to mothers who've been drinking and so on and so forth. So um, I think both DHA and choline are potent regulators, ameliorators of a lot of neurological decline and improve memory and cognition. So important to eat those. <clears throat> Other factors, zinc. So zinc has been uh, very closely tied to depression. And I didn't show you here, but depression is very <laughs> tied to reduced neurogenesis. So if we're depressed, we have depressed moods, or poor moods, our neurogenesis is also decreased. And so our memory and ability to learn is decreased. So supplementation with zinc is very important to keep our nervous system going. It's also very important during development. And so all of the factors I've been talking to you about all important both during development and adulthood. So basically they are kind of have this generalized uh, property to regulate stem cells. Doesn't doesn't matter whether they're you know uh, embryonic stem cells or adult. Um, other factors, vitamin E and flavonoids have been linked. So flavonoids are those compounds present in a lot of fruits and vegetables. Vitamin E, we probably all heard about. They also are capable to improve our cognitive function and induce adult neurogenesis and to keep it a little bit higher rate. And other nutrients, I will just show you here, that have been kind of recently emerging, but they have connection to improving adult neurogenesis. So this compound has been isolated from the green tea, so the green tea extract has been shown to improve proliferation of stem cells or di division of stem cells in the adult brain. And also the component of turmeric or cumin, and also vitamin A and blueberries. Uh, so these are kind of the major player then if you screen the literature of all the compounds that can increase uh, the production of new neurons in the brain, they'll come out as com kind of repetitive uh, compounds. Doesn't mean that other nutrients don't play a role, it just means that people maybe have not looked at them in the context of adult neurogenesis and cognitive function. The prior slide says full spectrum vitamin E, you mean like uh, uh, vitamin E alpha, beta, delta? Sure. <laughs> um, I just know it's vitamin not, E. It's not the synthetic vitamin E that's mm -hmm. available in, you know, that's, that proliferates in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. I would suggest that my personal, well, I'm not a doctor, but I would say if you need supplementation, your doctor will tell which, which form you need. But uh, I'm just saying to you that people use vitamin E, and I don't know if I've seen that they're breaking down into particular, you know, forms, actually. So I would say, the foods that contain that vitamin would be the best source instead of a supplement. I don't think we can rely totally on a supplement. Um, okay, so the lifestyle factors and other dietary considerations. So I guess there are two major dietary combined with lifestyle factors that will affect adult neurogenesis. And one of them is reduced caloric intake. So basically reducing our food intake and calories that we eat in general, but in reducing food intake has a major impact on, uh, on neurogenesis and cognitive function. This is just showing that you know the, the portions have grown tremendously since whatever the year was. Um, and you know, people, a lot of times you go to a restaurant, you get a lot of food and um, you know, reducing, try to reduce the intake is probably a good, good thing. And there are other studies that support this. And one of the recent studies I wanted to go over has to do with fasting, which is also has to do with reduced caloric intake. So fasting in this particular study, it was just a very short a period of time where you don't not eat, you just reduce your caloric intake. And so in this particular study in humans, what they've done was five days every month, for three months, five days, you reduce your food intake by about 34 to 54%. Doesn't mean that you take one food out or put one in or something. You kind of just reduce overall your food intake for a few days a month. And so that has been shown to increase the lifespan, which is the most important thing. You can induce neurogenesis and do all these things, 
But it doesn't mean a good thing until you actually seek some kind of very significant improvement. And in these studies, in the mouse and in another organism, which is yeast, you in, in, increase the lifespan. And together with this, there are other biomarkers such as diabetes and cancer and other cardiovascular disease that go down. So this generally very good thing, and regeneration seems to be activated not only in the brain, but in all other, other systems as well. So that's one factor to consider along with supplementing with you know, right dietary nutrients and so on. So other positive factors. So this is the second major one. Physical exercise has been known for a while that this induces neurogenesis and increases and you know, improves cognitive performance. So that's another one together with caloric uh, restriction, another very, very important factor. And that's a lifestyle factor. And also enrichment, so like cognitive uh, enrichment, such as puzzles, games, learning new hobbies, doing something interesting, reading, and things like that, to keeping our brain kind of learning and active, that will also stimulate uh, neurogenes and better learning uh, ability. And then negative factors, stress. So stress has been also associated with reduced neurogenesis and poor cognitive performance, sleep deprivation, high fat, high sugar diet, and alcohol consumption. So basically, um, you know, everything that makes us healthy and vibrant, including vegetables and fruit that we eat, that we don't overeat, that we do, you know, moderate exercise, and we learn new things. So everything that will make us healthy in theory will actually increase our neurogenesis and improve our cognitive function. So I don't think there's one magic pill that will combine something that you can eat and then you know, regenerate all your cognitive ability, but I think you know, it's important to consider a lot of different lifestyle factors together. Okay, so that's all I have for today. So I'd like to thank our lab again, our funding sources. I hope you learned something at least something today and thank you for coming.